One of the beauties about free enterprise and my belief about humans cooperating in an organic way is these things do have a way of working themselves out. So if you found your way to your own table tonight and didn't need a government bureaucrat to tell you how to get there, <laughs> congratulations. All right, so here's our plan tonight. I would just like to say that it is so fun to be doing an event tonight where I am the second most interesting person who will be speaking. <laughs> and, I, and I want all of you who said, um, David, it's our first event we've ever come to. We're so happy you have Larry here. I just want to tell you that my feelings weren't hurt at all, none, none taken. Um, listen, we're kind of doing a double dip tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about the market. You, they're bringing out your salads and everything, and, and uh, we'll, Larry and I will be talking together during dinner. But it also is serving tonight. You guys are basically the guest of honor at the very first book release event for my brand new book, which you all have on your tables. And oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My joke a few moments ago about organic social cooperation was not really a joke. In the book, there's actually a section on social organization and the miracle of human action because we were created as rational and free people and we really don't need to be told what to do that much. Um, listen, the reason why the book... <laughs> the reason why I wrote this book is not very... It's not very investment specific. But I have been saying at these events for years, and I've been talking to a lot of you privately for years, I have more awareness than most. Larry, Larry might be keen to this too, but I don't even know how much he has to be exposed to it. The economic ignorance, I don't mean investment ignorance or portfolio management ignorance or political ignorance, all of those things are there too. But the economic ignorance that exists in most of the advisor community, the people who are paid in our country to deliver professional investment advice is staggering. And I do believe that people become better investors with some understanding of economics. And I do believe that investment managers, like myself and my team at the Bonson Group, are better investment managers as a result of having some degree or belief system or worldview around economics. But I did not really write the book because I think there are, like, I'm not going to send it to Bernie Sanders and say, Bernie, check it out, tell me what you think. <laughs> like, and that's fine. Um, my understanding is he actually is a very polite guy sometimes to talk to and civil and whatnot. But, like, the, look, a very, very progressive, socialistic, collectivist is probably not who the book was intended to, but maybe some who are younger, who are still impressionable, still learning. I hope that it will influence people like that. But I do think there's a lot of people who actually are different that have an instinct for free markets, have an impulse that makes them lean more towards the side of free enterprise than not, but I'm not sure that they fully understand why. I'm not sure they've ever necessarily been taught, because if they either weren't taught economics in high school or college, or the worst thing is maybe they were, okay? <laughs> and I want very much through the platform that God has given me and the, um, the stage I have and the career I have as a professional investment manager, I want there to be more economic understanding in our country where the free enterprise advocates know why they believe what they believe and can defend it around transcendent truths that mean a great deal to me. And that's what the book's about. And I think you will find a lot of application but because I don't think I'm smart enough to write it all myself, what I did here is take 250 quotes from some of the great economists who ever lived. Some of them are guys like mine and Larry's good friends. Art Laffer, who's Larry's best friend, is quoted in here several times. There's a whole lot of these supply side heroes, of which, of course, our guest tonight is one of them. But there's also economists that were from the 18th century, like Adam Smith. David Ricardo is in the early 19th century. And throughout the whole 20th, your Milton Friedman's, Thomas Sowell's, Friedrich Hayek's. These are guys that are legends. I've been studying and reading since I was very, very young. And, I, and they influenced my life and my, my uh, intellectual journey a great deal. And what I did is I took 250 quotes from these guys that I hand-selected, and I wrote 250 commentaries on each one of them. 
and did it by topic. So there's a whole category about taxation, about credit, about um, you know, various categories that might be relevant to economic and, and social life, and that's what the book is. So I wanted you all to get a copy tonight. I really hope you enjoy it. Listen, honestly, tonight is a different program. There are some questions you guys sent in that are more current events, more market sensitive, and I'll get to some of that in the Q&A. We got a lot of great questions, and thank you. Particularly want to thank Pete Grande, who sent in like 19 questions for himself. <laughs> Um, there, I didn't have to read any other emails once I got Pete's email. It was all teed up, but no. Um, it, one of the things that happened when I brought Larry on board earlier in the year um, is I gained a couple different things. I not only gained an advisor and a counselor who I can go to frequently, bounce ideas off, ask him his opinion. Sometimes we might even argue a little bit about an issue. You know, we... we we see a lot of things in the world the same, but there are certain differences and we'll hash them out. Um, so he's become an incredibly valuable advisor and counselor in that regard. But I also wanted to be able to put uh, Larry in front of clients every now and then. Now he has a daily show. How many of you watch Cudlow on Fox Business? And um, how many of you watched the old Cudlow show that was on CNBC back before he was in the White House? Remember that show? See, listen, the show on Fox Business is outstanding for those of us on the West Coast because it's on at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So all of us can sit and watch it right after lunch, where, of course, the other show um, didn't come on until later into the day. But um, I think that Larry has a lot to say that you guys will benefit from. And I was talking to my team about this this morning. I've been doing these events either very small, intimate uh, breakfast, lunches, dinners, larger quarterly dinner events at our old uh, stomping grounds at the Ritz restaurant, um, the big annual dinners, which we've done at the Bay Club, we've done here, we've done at the Island. You, you guys know the kind of uh, journey we've had around a lot of those events. But it more or less has been happening for 20 years. And there's only been one other time until tonight that I had someone else up with me and that was the time in this very room that I had Lowell Miller from Miller Howard, who was a mentor to me around dividend growth investing. And he, is, he has since retired. And I actually stay in quite frequent touch with him. He still remains a great friend. But I brought Lowell up one time, and we talked dividend growth. And, and, and now tonight, we're going to have Larry. But the reason for that is, I guess, there's very few people I have ever trusted to come share insights with clients. I do think that anything that gets said on a stage that I'm paying for, I'm responsible for. And there are a lot of money managers out there that may or may not be good at managing money, but they also may say things that I wouldn't want representative of the Bonson Group. Um, I also believe that being the person speaking over the years has always forced a certain degree of accountability. I've said plenty of things, by the way, I've been wrong about. But it, I said them, and I was wrong, and I own it. And there's a sort of forced accountability when you're the person that's doing the writing, doing the TV, doing the speaking at the dinner. So I like that accountability. Um, and, and I guess over the years, it's helped kind of build some of that relationship. It's built some of the connection that we're very blessed to have at the Bonson Group with all of you. In the, in the case of our guest tonight, it, he just is somebody that um, there's nothing he could say that could ever... Uh, embarrass me. That's how much confidence I have in him, how, how high regard I hold him in. And, and so let me just make a few comments on the market and then we'll get to the fun stuff. So this way I truly do save the best for last. Um, it has been a very interesting year. As I'm sitting here today, S&Ps are up somewhere in the range of 20%. The Dow's up somewhere in the range of 15% year to date. It was less than that at the end of the third quarter, but there's been a bit of movement higher uh, just in the few weeks since Q3 ended. Um, the core dividend portfolio is, is probably sitting somewhere around 26% on the year. Um, but other than the safest asset class on the planet, which is what we call at the Bonson Group, boring bonds, it is essentially an uh, encapsulation of either treasuries, very high quality munis, or very high quality corporates. There really isn't an asset class that's underwater on the year. So it's been a very good year for risk on, 
And then ironically, someone who is totally gone hyper safe might be down one, two, or three percent, depending on their duration inside a taxable fixed income portfolio. If you're in boring bonds in Muni, you're probably not even down because Muni spreads have tightened enough that even boring bonds in Muni is even with longer dated yields moving higher have actually uh, still moved into positive territory more or less. So is this a big surprise? I think it's a pretty common question. Um, it's a different reason than last year, okay? Um, it's something, by the way, that, that Larry asked me a lot on his radio show that he does Saturday morning on WABC in New York, and I've talked about with him on television. Um, why is the market up? And last year, people said, why is the market up? And at the time they were saying it, like half of the world was locked in their bedroom. And, and now the only people locked in their bedroom are um, they're like rich people in San Francisco or something. For the most part, most of America has reopened for business and has decided to act like human beings that want free uh, freedom and interaction in the community. But a year ago, the market was on fire and there was a lot of uncertainty around the election. There was literally a shutdown economy and yet markets were moving higher purely on the basis, which proved to be totally accurate, that not everybody was going to die. Write that down. When not everyone's going to die, that is better than when everyone is going to die for markets. So there was this relief around the fact that the COVID scare of March did not become something worse than it became. As awful as it was, the markets were able to price in a kind of ceiling to what the damage would be. There was a significant amount of stimulus and support, both from the Fed and, of course, out of the, the CARES Act legislation, some of which our guest tonight helped to craft and form. Um, whenever people ask me about that, I always say, everything in the CARES Act I like, Larry wrote, and everything I don't like, the other guys wrote. But no, the, the, the fact of the matter is that markets were not going up a year ago because things were good. Markets were going up a year ago because always and forever, markets are discounting mechanisms, pricing in about into the present what they believe about the future. And it may be counterintuitive, but it was not the exception to the rule last year either. It's always the rule, markets are forward looking. So when you're looking at present bad news or even less helpful past bad news, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the way markets would think about the future. Um, regardless of what different people wanted about an outcome around the election, the fact of the matter was that the worst case scenario of a significant amount of uncertainty and, the wor and I would add, and I guess I'm being a little political here, but I think I'm being very objective. Um, there were polls that had the Democrats taking 54, 55 seats in the Senate. And I talked about it over and over again. I wrote about it literally 50 times in the DC Today, that the biggest issue to markets was not gonna be what took place at 1600 Pennsylvania. It was going to be the Senate race in Iowa, in Montana, in Maine, and in North Carolina. And four out of those four very close seats, all of which had the polls had the Democrat winning by somewhere between two and 10 points, all four were won by the Republican. Now, of course, you guys know two months later after the election, the Georgia thing went from this being a 52-48 Republican Senate to a 50-50, and there is the tiebreaker with Vice President Harris and all that. But markets still then knew that 50-50 was not gonna be the same thing as a 54-55 type majority. In fact, even again, this is how brilliant markets are at pricing things in. And a lot of this price mechanism is some of the stuff I talk about in the book and it's evidenced in equity prices, it's evidenced in, in these election results. The markets were pricing in the reality that expectations were for things getting set to a more progressive agenda that would allow for greater tax increases potentially, that would allow for greater regulation potentially, and regardless of where things ended up, which for my friends on the left, my friends on the right, my friends in the middle, wherever people are, I've never talked to anyone who's totally happy with the outcome. Like there was something about what took place that everyone's unhappy about, depending on where you kind of come from in your own political belief system. That's fair enough. However, what did happen directionally was some of the market unfriendly things that happened 
were not as market unfriendly as had been concerned, as, as people had been concerned about. And, and so regardless of not necessarily liking that total outcome, the markets were then having to kind of correct to the fact that perhaps there was a bit of margin in how things would play out. And, and we're seeing a lot of that now. I, uh, I'm going to talk, I'll wait till, till Larry's up for us to talk together about the reconciliation bill and what we, we both expect is going to happen there. Um, so at the end of the day, there's a lot of liquidity in the system. The Fed's been um, accommodative to a fault. The um, political risks that a lot of people feared have not been able to play out. And, um, you know, the economy has recovered. The, the vaccine ha has worked. And, and even where there's been uh, difficulties around vaccine and some of the Delta things that took place, one thing that was abundantly clear this summer is the uh, American people are ready to have their lives back. And, and that means shopping and that means working and that means producing and, and getting back to the, um, the things that in the book I call human action. And they are the things that I, as a, um, uh, forgive me for sounding like a Bible thumper. Well, actually, you don't have to forgive me. I can do whatever I want. I'm paying, I'm paying like for everything. <laughs> I believe that we were made to produce. And I think that what the economy has been reflecting this year is people that were for very unfortunate circumstances. For circ we can argue what policies we liked and didn't like out of the whole thing. There's a lot I didn't like. But the reality is that the economy recovered. The economy is recovering. There's a lot of liquidity in the system. There's a very low cost of capital. And then here's the bottom line. I've wait I took way too long to get to this. Last year, it was pricing and things being better in the future. This year, earnings have just been smoking good. Earnings are up year over year in pretty much direct correlation to how the markets are up year over year. And so even apart from multiple expansion, if the market was trading somewhere in the 22, 23, 24 times range a year ago, it's trading 22, 23, 24 times now, and yet it's 20% higher because the earnings themselves are higher. The markets have heavily required multiple expansion for a number of years. This year, it's pretty much been the E, not the P to E, for those of you who know what I mean, the price to earnings ratio. Um, that's very good news. That, that's a big explanation that is reasonable. Um, the bad news, certain pockets of things within that are undoubtedly overpriced. Certain things within that are undoubtedly irrational. There are certain behavioral characteristics that are very reminiscent of an era we lived through in the late 1990s. And I don't know how it's going to play out. And I wouldn't dare to predict when or what will happen. But I certainly want, as best as I'm able, as we, as a team at TBG, guide your asset management, we want to avoid things that we think are susceptible to insane bubble conditions. Um, that's bad news, one, that there is the risk of some of that, um, shall we say, uh, uh, euphoria, that exuberance. You remember uh, Chair, Chairman Greenspan's famous line about irrational exuberance. By the way, a, a, a little tid, a, a tidbit on that line, I know Larry remembers this, Alan Greenspan said irrational exuberance in 1995. The, the NASDAQ blew up in 2000. In the S&P had some of its greatest years in history, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99. Um, and so predicting when irrationality meets its maker is very hard to do. I don't think we got five years left of some of this, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't sit here and tell you that a lot of these overpriced names are going to blow up tomorrow because I just have no idea. But I don't want to own them regardless. Um, the second piece of bad news is that the market cannot continue growing earnings at this rate without a better economy, and it can't have a better economy um, if certain policy decisions undermine that. It can't have a better economy if we don't get more business investment. It, it, we, we are going to, at some point in time, have to have a GDP growth that gets us back near the trend line level. We got it in, in um, 2018. You had basically that 3% real GDP growth that kind of flirted with the, the trend line level. I, I don't mind saying that that was the first full year that Mr. Cudlow was uh, the National Economic <laughs> Council director. So, you know, you can decide how much of that is coincidental and not. But there were a lot of reasons the economy is doing well. Um, and, and yet, you know, we, it's not been sustained. It was looking very strong. We know what happened with COVID. Here we are now. The economy is not primarily a political um, 
subject. The economy, we overstate the politics of economic activity all the time. Uh, it happens more now than it used to because the country is headed in a very tribalistic path. I've always said presidents get way too much credit and way too much blame. And, and I say that as someone who thinks some presidents have deserved some blame and some presidents have deserved some credit. But even then, it's probably overdone on both sides. But you take politics out of it, in, to a certain degree, let's take policy out of it for a moment. Um, you have to have businesses investing in the future. You cannot get a continued profit growth without economic growth. You cannot get economic growth without productivity growth. You cannot get productivity growth without investment, and you cannot get investment without savings, and it's very hard to get savings when we're spending ourselves into oblivion. So there is a debt component that hurts savings, which then hurts investment. Now, one of the very, very fair arguments someone can make back to me is, hey, we've been overspending for a long time, and we've had plenty of productivity. I think that's true. I think that the issue is that there's a diminishing return on the productivity of the spend of the debt. That it is clearly now in a place that debt that is taken on for transfer payments does not have the same productivity as debt taken on because of, let's say, a supply side tax cut. Those are just categorically different things. And yet, um, there's still plenty of businesses that have incentive to want to produce, to want to invest. So capital expenditures, industrial production, the state of our manufacturing industry, there's all of these aspects that are gonna dictate how economic growth goes into 22, 23, and yet right now, how can anyone give a very clear assessment when half the ports are, are closed, the ships are, are backed up, they can't get laborers to get the trucks to take stuff away. So the supply chain side is not just a problem in the obvious sense, it's a problem because of itself, but it's also a problem because of the signal. Namely, I can't get a signal. I can't get data, I can't get a good read on what we can sort of project into the future with this kind of disruptive activity out of the supply chain side. That's my basic assessment of the economy right now and where that will fit into where markets go next year. But as a general rule of thumb, I believe always and forever that ups and downs in the economic cycle are not timeable, not uh, predictable, and that far more money is lost with somebody saying that I'm gonna jump out and wait to get back in. Their asset allocation has got to um, codify what they believe and need out of the investment portfolio. It has got to encapsulate the, the, the sum of expectations, both on the risk and the reward side. Um, because the fact of the matter is that you will never make just one mistake. It'll always be two. You'll get out at the wrong time and then regret kicks back in and it's impossible to come back in psychologically. I've seen it many, many times. And uh, we're, we're working very hard to keep that from happening. Um, all right, I wanna be able to move things forward to our guest. So what I want to do right now is briefly uh, play a little video for you. And while the video's playing, Larry's gonna join me on stage and he and I are gonna have a little conversation I'll let you guys cue the screen and invite Larry to come up. David Bonson, founding and managing partner of the Bonson Group. I've been advising them, pleased to continue to do so. So David, it's not that I don't care what the Treasury Secretary says on this subject, but actually I don't care what the Treasury says on this subject. Bitcoin is here to stay. You know it and I know it. Well, it certainly is. I think the difference people have to make is understanding Bitcoin as a medium of exchange versus the price that one is paying for a Bitcoin. I mean, have you ever said it was down 20% from its high of two days ago? You know, and we're talking about this stable medium of exchange to substitute the U.S. dollar. So well, Senator Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax is back. I think the best way to raise more revenues from the rich or the non-rich, but particularly the wealthiest people, David, is to lower their tax rates. You have this incredible idea that incentives work <laughs> and, and that you, when you tax more of something, you get less of it. And when you cut taxes, you get more of it. 
And, and, and I think at the end of the day, uh, Liz must have read my chapter in my Elizabeth Warren book because she's got all of my, my points beautifully <laughs> encapsulated. <laughs> David Bonson, I want to ask you, did you hear the McConnell interview? Did you hear what the Senate Republican leader said? And if you did, what did you think about it? I sure did, Larry, and I liked what I heard. But ultimately, the issue that he reinforced is uh, the fact that we got economic growth out of the tax cuts of 2017 going into 18. So David Bonson, I got Afghanistan catastrophe. I got higher spending. I got higher taxing. I got higher regulating. I got um, kill fossil fuels. And yet the stock market keeps going up. You have to explain this to me. Well, some of those things in your list are true and they're bad in the world news cycle. And the world news cycle and the stock market have never been that correlated. But Larry, some of those things in your list aren't true yet. They're proposed. Mm. They're being discussed. Higher taxes hasn't happened all year. It could. Higher spending hasn't happened. That first COVID bill got through. We were worried about a $2 trillion infrastructure. It came in at $500 billion. We don't know where that's going. It's still divided government. That's still the story with the market on taxes. But the market priced out the idea of worst case scenarios because the worst case scenarios are not going to happen. I was, think I was listening to your last segment because you know I'm a uh, supply sider to the core and I was in a lot of ways mentored by the host of this show. I'm just wondering, David, if us bulls, we bulls, maybe we aren't fully invested anymore. What's your quick take last 30 seconds? Yeah, real quick. It's a great time to be an asset allocator, not a full-blown bull. Oh. Allocate across bonds, across other asset classes. Look at your real estate. Look at your alternatives. Rebalance. You Got never it. want to be overly exposed. That's my take in this time. They have a conference at the White House for the electric car makers. Tesla is the biggest electric car maker and seller, and they didn't invite him. You think he has a beef on that? Yeah, I would say so. I think that there are consumers out there that didn't know there are any other car companies <laughs> in the electric space besides Tesla. And, and so doing this would be like having a smartphone conference and not inviting Apple. <laughs> the only time for all the years we've been friends and the thousands of times you've been on TV and hundreds of times I've been on TV, the only time we were ever on TV together down on the floor of the stock exchange at the other network and you started talking about the Phillips curve and how it was dead and gone forever. Mm. And that was when the Fed was wanting to raise interest rates because they were worried about inflation. I have to say real quick, I cannot tell you what a blessing it was to sit here with Larry Kudlow. Larry is one of my best pals. And to hear everything he had to say about the death of the Phillips curve was inspiring. And I, <laughs> I will, I, I, I I will say, I, I, if I'm not telling tales out of school, you were applauding. I when, was. Uh, when he and, was cheering up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Here we are now on TV together, and it's the exact opposite story. The Fed has no idea what causes inflation, and it won't happen as long as we keep the currency sound. More to be revealed, David Bonson. I appreciate it very much. I do believe the Phillips curve trade-off between more people working and inflation is dead. Oh, Larry. <laughs> You know, I uh, got to introduce Larry on a stage um, in, Somebody to bring, yeah, bring, whatever you can to soften it a bit. Is that? Bring that light down for there me. There we go. It's way too hard. There we go. Okay, that's okay. better. Thanks. I introduced Larry on a stage at the Balboa Bay Club uh, when he was the keynote speaker at a Lincoln Club of Orange County event number, uh, it was about seven or eight years ago. And at that time, um, it was a very personal introduction for me. Uh, we weren't working together professionally. Um, he, was, he was still at uh, CNBC at the time. This is way before, if somebody had said in 2013, Donald Trump's gonna be president, I, I don't think uh, it would have been taken so seriously. Um, but we, it was a long time ago. But what I said that night that I'm gonna spare you guys kind of the whole, the whole story tonight is I really love being on Larry's show. I really love my conversations with Larry. I love my dinners with him and his lovely wife, Judy, who couldn't be here tonight. But um, more than the economic mentoring, more than what I've learned about supply side economics from Larry, um, he has modeled a civility in the public square 
that is very, very important to me. I don't always emulate it perfectly, but I truly, from the bottom of my heart, try. And Larry is referred to as a happy warrior because he feels very strongly about things he believes in, but he has a joy and an optimism that one of his former bosses also had, and that was former President Ronald Reagan. Um, on the personal side, Larry has changed my life in a lot of ways. I won't get into now, but I just want you to know that he is not only an outstanding um, patriot, an outstanding uh, economic advisor, and an outstanding anchor, but he is a very, very dear friend, and I love this man very much. Thank you for being here, Larry. So I know your most recent time in the White House was under the Trump administration. You were the National Economic Council Director for three years, and I'm sure we'll get to a few questions on President Trump. But as I mentioned, several decades ago, you worked for another American president in the White House. You were an economist in the Office of Management and Budget for Ronald Reagan. And I, because I am, of course, a diehard Reaganite, and a few folks in the room are, just tell us a little bit about your experience. Reagan's so popular now, even the Democrats like him. <laughs> Larry, tell us a little bit about your experience working for Ronald Reagan. Well, uh, it's good to be here. Thanks to everybody who came. Thank you, David. The, the most interesting thing for me personally is that I've had two tours, one under Reagan and then one 40 years later under Trump. So I do this every 40 years, <laughs> whether I need to or not. I didn't know if I'll make the next 40 year cut. We'll see. Uh, look, I mean, there were actually, in policy terms, quite similar presidents, which is one reason why I'm a bridge between those two, uh, those two men, because Reagan was the supply side tax cutter, and Reagan was a deregulator. Reagan deregulated the price of oil, which is kind of something people forget. And um, everybody said it went from $3 to $40, and everybody said if you deregulate it would go to $100. In fact, I won a bet with James Schlesinger, former energy secretary, who's uh, now gone, but he's a wonderful man, a brilliant guy, and I said it would it might get to 100, but it would get to 10 first. And oil collapsed after he deregulated the price. So you have three areas, tax cuts, overall deregulation, and uh, energy. Trump pursued very similar policies to Reagan. Trump helped deregulate all of the energy sector. And we were the number one producer in the world. We're now two million barrels a day short, but, and that's probably the main reason gasoline prices have jumped so much, but it was a similarity to, to Reagan's view. I, I'm not sure that President Trump necessarily saw it all that way, but, you know, he had some people, as Trump had some old Reagan people. Uh, now, I was in the government as uh, assistant to the president and head of the National Economic Council, but outside the government was another La uh, uh, Reagan person, that was Art Laffer, who was a, a dear friend of mine. And also, uh, I guess the junior partner in our law firm, Steve Moore, uh, who worked for Reagan towards the end. But, and, and also Steve Forbes played a role. So there's a lot of overlap that people may not un understood. And there were differences and obviously temperamental differences but I learned a lot. I was the deputy in OMB, Budget Bureau. And in those days, actually OMB was more powerful than it was uh, during the Trump years. But you, you do that, you, and I was there for three years, and you learn about the whole federal government. You just learn everything. OMB is a very powerful agency. OMB runs the executive branch. And, um, you know, I never forgot it. And it was my launch into politics from which I've never escaped and I don't want to escape. And so I've been a Republican advisor now for a long time and I'm glad of it. And we go through cycles, me and the GOP, you know, sometimes they listen, 
and they do well. <laughs> Sometimes they don't listen and they do very badly. <laughs> At least that's the way I see it. Yeah. You, um, you wrote a book a number of years ago, and, and so half of the book was about a Republican president, and, and he listened, Ronald Reagan, um, the influence of guys like Art Laffer, Jack Kemp, you all had a sort of supply side movement about the benefits of the economy and reducing marginal tax burden. But there was another president who also agreed with that, and he was not a Republican. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah, my, well, I wrote a book on John F. Kennedy, JFK and the Reagan Revolution, which uh, is still kicking out there, yeah. actually. Um, and the point was that Kennedy, the Democrat, was the first post-war supply sider. He slashed marginal tax rates on personal income and corporate income and capital gains. And it triggered a, essentially an eight or 10 year boom. And he went against his own party for the most part. And he went against his own uh, economists for the most part which is a complicated story, but basically he didn't listen to the liberal Keynesians on his own Council of Economic Advisors. He listened to a Republican banker who was his Treasury Secretary, the great Douglas Dillon. Yeah. Um, 20 years later, Reagan comes, and unfortunately, Republicans and Democrats went off the JFK supply side. LBJ raised taxes, Nixon raised taxes. Uh, Carter tried to, I think he, actually Carter cut the capital gains tax, but he didn't do it, he was jammed, he was forced to do it. But, you know, you had this combination of a collapsing dollar and high tax rates, so Reagan comes in and changes that and gets back on the supply side path. That path, by the way, is essential to classical economics. If you read, uh, well, nowadays you could read Thomas Sowell, uh, probably the best practitioner. Uh, and of course, many others. Um, you can't think of anyone else who would write a book about this? <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> but I mean, with respect, Sol is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sol's a giant figure. I, that's why in, I, had to, I had to quote him. For, in the yeah. economics profession. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the late Robert Mundell, who won a Nobel Prize. Uh, and to a lesser extent, Milton Friedman, uh, who wasn't such a supply sider, but was a free market thinker. Um, the antecedent for Kennedy, I might add, I want to make two more points. The antecedent for Kennedy was in the 1920s, uh, in the post-World War I period, you had uh, Warren Harding and Calvin Coolidge and Andrew Mellon. Now, these are guys who are almost lost to history because the history profession is so goddamn left wing, they won't admit it. But we had a phenomenal, a phenomenal boom during that period. And then, frankly, we suffered for the next 30 years. And we spent a lot of money investing in the war, and that was important, but that's not what carried the economy. So the supply side uh, model works, and Laffer and Mundell and some others put it back on the table and Reagan used it. The other thing I want to say is this needn't be, this is one of my favorite little hobby horses, it need not be Democrat versus Republican. Now, I will tell you, I am a former Democrat, a long time ago, but still I was a Democrat. Uh, Ronald Reagan was a former Democrat. Donald Trump was a former Democrat. I've always said that former Democrats make the best Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> now, now you, we don't have enough time. You can draw your own conclusions about that. That is what you call a value-loaded assertion. Yes. But that is my, that is my view. Uh, actually, Art Laffer, uh, he wasn't a Democrat per se, but he advised a lot of Democrats. You just have to have good common sense, if you ask me. You either understand business economics or you don't. 
Okay, you either understand to create a good job, a good high paying job with the future, you have to have a healthy business, you have to have a profitable business. But if you're taxing the profits to death, then the company will shrink, the workforce will be laid off, and the wage levels will fall, and the typical middle class family will lose income. And you can't have this healthy business at the beginning of its time unless you have investment, investors. Investors to put capital in. Now, this is just common sense, honestly. I'm not, I don't have to be a Democrat or Republican to understand this. Right now, in Washington, you have a very interesting battle. And one of the reasons I think the stock market has improved in the last few weeks is that Joe Biden's idea of transforming America uh, culturally, uh, economically, and in terms of foreign policy has collapsed. And all of his tax hikes, uh, not all, but most have collapsed. Whatever comes out, it's not gonna be as bad as, as it could have been. It's Democrats who are sponsoring this, old fashioned Democrats. Now, Joe Manchin, whom I've known for quite some time, is an old fashioned blue collar Democrat. Now, he will tax, but he has single-handedly knocked out the Green New Deal, or let's say the worst aspects of it. <laughs> and he has the outrageous notion that the social safety net is good. America is a very generous country. But you should have work requirements so you don't live on the government dole for your whole life. Now, he is a Democrat. Now, there's another Democrat, uh, one that I don't know, uh, Kirsten Sinema. I don't know, never met her. So, she now has to run for her life. I mean, all these lefties are chasing her into bathrooms and trains and airports. I mean, it's really, talk about lack of civility. It's just unbelievable to me. I'm an old guy, I don't get this. but. She's been saying, it's just that nobody listened to her for the last couple of months, she does not want to raise tax rates on companies, on individuals, and on capital gains. Why? Because she says this all the time, Arizona is open for business, and she doesn't want to penalize through national policies the successes of the state of Arizona. Now, there's a Democrat saying that. And there's a couple of Democrats behind them who actually agree, but don't have the backbone to stand up and say it. But they're in there, they're in the mix. I wouldn't name names, but I know exactly who they are. And this is an example of why supply side economics, or what I choose to call business common sense, is not partisan. There's no reason why it has to be partisan. And so I'm looking at this with great interest because I think it's going to prove one of my long-held theories. Well, Larry, I want to reinforce that how nonpartisan this is, um, not, not only because I think it is objectively true and fair. I, I certainly uh, ha don't have any desire for this to be a, a partisan conversation, neither do you. But I actually say this because I believe that some tremendously great things were done by Democrats in office. It just so happens that they agreed with you on these issues. And you brought up work requirements. Well, to my knowledge, the most significant um, bill passed in my adult lifetime had work requirements attached to it around welfare reform, and that was by Democrat President Bill Clinton and a Republican Congress. And there. Republican Congress, that's right, that's, that's right. That's really. Right. But, of course, but of course, you know, Larry, you can say the same. I don't want to give, I don't want to demean Clinton, it was his finest moment. Uh, he is a longtime friend of mine when I see him in yeah. New York. I often congratulate him for being Reagan's third term. Yeah. <laughs> he, he sometimes, I get a little smile, and sometimes I don't. But I will agree with you, 
and there were good Democrat votes in Congress to support that, although it was an overwhelmingly Republican uh, Congress. Look. But couldn't they, you say the same thing on that point, Larry, on Tip O'Neill, 86, Reagan's tax bill? No. What's he, the difference Tip O'Neill opposed everything we did. We, they just got the votes because they whipped him. We whipped him on everything in the tax cuts of 81, the defense buildup in 81 and beyond. On Social Security, we whooped him. And later on, we whooped him on tax reform in 86. But the reason we whooped him was we appealed to um, the Blue Dog Democrats. Southern. You know. Bo Weevils or Yellow Dog Democrats. And unfortunately, there aren't, there aren't any more left, hardly. You're just seeing Manchin. In the, there's almost nothing going on in the House. I mean, I, I think, look, I, I, I don't. I'm not here to proselytize you, vote for whomever you want to vote for. I'll just tell you, in my, it is astonishing to me how far left the Democratic Party has gone. It's just astonishing. The left-wing progressive view, which is about government central planning, it's about uh, critical race theory, it's about woke cultural social theories, it's about taxing the rich just to punish the rich. There's no reason for it. Their own, their own budget numbers, we looked at the Bernie Sanders budget when it was published, shows the economy is expected to grow by less than 2%. I mean, if I was going to sell you something, I'd want to sell it on the basis of better growth and prosperity. No. They're doing it to redistribute income and wealth, and they're doing it to, uh, to just get at rich people, to penalize success. This is not a good idea. This is not a good idea, and it runs counter to the American tradition, and that's one of the reasons why Biden's polls have crashed. People have looked at his transformational agenda, and they don't like it. Now, the fact that the polls have crashed is very bullish, very bullish, to come home to the stock market. And you know, my hope is, <laughs> A, that Manchin and Cinema keep standing up, okay? And B, that the elections actually in the next week or two, but particularly next year, uh, send a pretty strong message to the Democrats and m maybe move them back to center. But I, look, I'm not going to kid you. I want the GOP to take over the House and Senate again. I think we, we lost it. For, we did very well in the House in 2020, picked up, oh, I don't know, 40, 45 seats, almost took it. We did very badly in the Senate. We lost a couple races we should have won because, unfortunately, my boss's last few months were very disappointing. You know, I acknowledge that and mistakes were made. But it's not forever. It's not forever. And as David says, the stock market looks ahead, and I think it sees better economic policies. Well, let me, let me um, kind of get back on, on my script of a couple of the questions I, I thought the audience would like to hear about in terms of your journey. You, you had your own show on CNBC for many years as this new unsettling century began from the tech dot-com crash to 9-11, to the great financial crisis. Um, you were live every day as significant turmoil rattled markets. Then, fast forward, you were directing economic policy of our country when the COVID calamity hit last year. And I guess I'm curious, your time at Bear Stearns, your time in the White House, and your time at the, at the networks, what do you like better of the three seats you've held when huge turmoil comes, a Wall Street firm, a policymaker in the White House, or a television studio chair? <laughs> you know, I am a guy who has been very blessed by the Lord. It's been a huge part of my life. I've had my ups and downs. We're having a good run now lately, the last 15, 20 years, 25 years. But each one of those was a separate. Look, I started uh, my first job out of Princeton graduate school was at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York yeah. in open market operations in, in, hold on, 1973. 1973. Somebody came up to me before during cocktails and, and said they went to high school in my hometown 
uh, I think he said 1976 or 77. I said, you're a child. So what do you say if I tell but, you I was born in 1974? <laughs> I know all about you. <laughs> but, you know, the, the Fed was a great job. Wall Street was great. Going to Washington was great. Coming back to Wall Street, uh, getting my personal life together and uh, uh, turning back to faith was great. Uh, Becoming a TV broadcaster, radio broadcaster, was a phenomenal thing. Happened completely out of left field. You can tell that story for just a second. It's yep. a funny story. Um, I don't know if you, you've seen my pal Geraldo Rivera on. <laughs> on right, I know, it's a mixed uh, response. Me, <laughs> me too. But, but I always kid him. I see him quite a bit now at Fox. I always, I've known Gerardo for a long time. I said, Gerardo, we owe it all to you. And he looks at me with a blank stare. I kind of had him there, speechless for a moment. This was a few months ago when I came to Fox. Because, the story goes, Jim Cramer and I were commentators uh, and the, at CNBC. And we used to go at each other. We had a great time doing it. We're very good friends to this day. And uh, after 9-11, when... Uh, the United States invaded Afghanistan. Geraldo, who had a prime time show from 9 to 10 p.m., uh, it was, he was the highest paid anchor on the show. I think he was making six million bucks a year, okay? Six million bucks. And even in 2001, that was a lot of money. And um, he ups and leaves. He just get, leaves to go cover the war in Afghanistan. He wasn't even affiliated with anybody. He just wanted to cover the war in Afghanistan. And um, they had a pretty big hole to fill, and I, I'm sitting in my office late one afternoon on a Thursday, and I get a call from the president of NBC News and said, Geraldo is gone, we gotta fill that slot, and you and Jim Cramer are gonna do it. And I go, whoa, now that's interesting. Jimmy had left his hedge fund by then? Uh, I don't know. I've never understood any of that, and I don't want to delve into it very much. Um, so I said to this guy, wow, great. Uh, you know, when do, when do we start training and rehearsing? I'd never read a teleprompter. I, I wouldn't know. I was a loud mouth. You know, I was a commentator. I didn't have to worry about running a show or anything like that. He said, you don't understand. You guys are starting Monday. This was Thursday afternoon. And that's how the whole thing started. And we were so bad at the beginning that it was funny, it was amusing. We would go through breaks. We'd be yelling at each other and stuff, and we'd blow through in an advertising break. We'd go through a hard break for the entire national network. We didn't know anything about that, and we cared less. Jimmy used to get so angry, he would stand up on the set, and you, the camera, wouldn't, you wouldn't see his face. You'd see his belt buckle, okay? <laughs> we had a lot of write-ins about his belt buckle. So that is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. This is my point. Uh, as a person of faith, I believe the Lord's hand was there and the door opened and I took it. And I was healthy enough and I could do it. And it was a wonderful thing. So, you know, never complain, never explain, work hard. I do six, six days a week. I have my entire career. I still do it because I do radio all morning on Saturdays. Uh, it's been a great experience. I'm blessed, really blessed. And the, the Trump thing, uh, I know some of you like him, some of you don't, I understand that. But here I am having this career, long career, with different hats, as David said. And, um, you know, now I got an office on the second floor of the West Wing. I'm in charge of uh, international and domestic economic policy. I have unlimited access to the President of the United States, and I was with him one way or another almost every day for three years. You know, so again, I would say this to anybody who's had a job like that, I don't care for whom or what party you're in, 
those are wonderful experiences and it gave me a chance to serve my country again. And I value that enormously. Well, in, in, in that period of time that you were there serving the country in, in the White House, the COVID pandemic came. And uh, it, it obviously represented a, a medical emergency for the country, but it represented an economic emergency as well. And, and so I'm just wondering, now that we look back, it's roughly 18 months ago, you were in kind of the code red, planning different things. I know you're in daily communique at the time with Secretary Mnuchin and Treasury. There's a team of people, but a lot of things going on. I would love to hear of the various things that you guys did, what is it you're most proud of in response to COVID economically? What moved the needle most in terms of protecting the economy, Larry? Well, um, I was a member of the COVID task force, uh, which was run by Mike Pence, uh, as was my very good friend, Steve Mnuchin, who's a wonderful, I think he'd he go down as one of the best treasury secretaries. And he and I worked hand in glove. So you're in this situation where you basically have no experience in dealing with this, and it comes on. When it came on, I'm gonna say when it came on for sure, it was fast. The roof fell in. Very few people, I mean, really, this is, by the second week of March, the roof fell in. And you didn't know that. There were rumors and there was table talk. Uh, China, I remember we, we uh, uh, stopped the uh, plane flights to China and we were criticized heavily for that uh, by the opposition, but of course we had to do it. Later on, we did it for Europe and the rest of the world. But you don't know, right? The last one of those was 1918, and not even I was there for that one. <laughs> so uh, you really had to put your finger. We were in constant session in the situation room downstairs. Again, Steve and I were the economics guys, and then you have all the health bureaucrats, I call them. Some good, some not so good. Uh, but, you know, and we had FEMA for the emergency stuff. We had uh, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, uh, and the CIA director. You, just, you all had to, you know, it was a government-wide uh, response or government-wide attempts at response. So then we, um, Steve and I caucused, we spoke to POTUS, President, and we said, this is going to be worse than you think, and we're going to have to come in uh, with much more assistance than you think. And uh, books are being written about this, and I've spoken to some of those reporters, some not all, never, never direct quotes. But the, the pivotal thing was a meeting um, in the, I think, I'm going to say the third week of March, where we were up on the hill constantly. I was living in the Senate Finance Committee. Steve Mnuchin was living in the Senate Banking Committee. Uh, and we had all of our top deputies engaged. And some of these kids had been congressional staffers and really, really knew the ropes. So you pulled out all the talent. And um, there was a meeting on, a, I was market a meeting on Saturday afternoon in the Senate Majority Leader's Office, Mitch McConnell. And uh, it was for the Republican conference and probably 40, uh, 40 Republican senators would be there. And if I'm wrong, there were more. And there, a lot of the senior staff got in that meeting. So it was a packed house in Mitch's conference room. And people were talking about this and that. We're gonna, you know, 100 billion, 200 billion. That's what they were talking about. And um, I don't know, I'm an independent operator. So I just sat there. I've known Mitch McConnell 30 years. I knew most people in that Senate conference room for a long time. I said, look, this will be 
more than a trillion dollars and will probably be much more than a trillion dollars. And you could have heard a pin drop. But that was my belief. And Mnuchin came to me later after that meeting and, and said thank you because I knew them, so they're comfortable. They, they know me. I wouldn't, you know, give them a runaround. And anyway, I'm not exactly the quintessential big spender and taxer. So when I said it's going to be at least a trillion and probably more. You had credibility. Yeah, I mean, that's, that set the stage. And then we went to work. And we generated, uh, I would do it again. I mean, there's a million things, but the basics there, uh, you know, we had to provide government income to supplant the complete loss of private sector income because the country was closed. It's not that everyone was sick necessarily, although the, those numbers became very tragic, but essentially it was because President Trump closed the country. Um, I think the first tranche was 30 days, then he extended it to 45 days. I don't remember exactly. So you have no income, no private income. In other words, free enterprise is not operating. But you have you know, 160 million people in the workforce, and you have a country of 325, 30 million people, and you got to do something to get through this. You know, we used to call it the bridge, the bridge to the other side, although we had no idea where the other side was going to be. Um, so we had unemployment compensation. We had a number of um, social safety net programs. We also had what I think was the best thing we did, and um, that was the payroll uh, protection program, the PPP protection program. And we, we got it off the ground. Mnuchin was, this is a treasury operation. We had never done anything, you know, he's operating through the IRS in the, and he was, did a great job getting that off the ground in just about two weeks, as I recall. It was remarkable. Checks started to flow. Checks flowed even faster than the political criticism. <laughs> for which we're all very proud, you know? Before they could come afterwards, we, we were actually helping people, you know, in government. It's always good to actually help people, not hurt them. This was one of those moments. And no, it wasn't our cup of tea. I'm a free market supply sider. I've been working 40 years at that. Mnuchin was a brilliant banker. Uh, you know, he ran the mortgage bond desk at Goldman Sachs and was a banker and a producer and all the rest of it. Um, but we were adults and we knew what we had to do. And we kept in touch with Pompeo, we kept in touch with Robert O'Brien on the national security side to make sure we were coordinated. I said, but this is coming, we have to do this. And that helped, it helped a lot of people. And here's the thing that we're most proud of. This was a bipartisan bill done in three weeks and passed both houses of Congress overwhelmingly overwhelmingly in 2020. We didn't use reconciliation. We didn't have to jam anything down. Any, we, we sent out checks. I couldn't stand it, but we had to do it. We had unemployment <laughs> compensation. You know, we doubled it. We were paying people. It's not that we were paying people not to work. We were just providing income for families. We helped out on child assistance. We obviously helped out, you know, the other side of the group, the other side of the group, uh, Jared Kushner and his crowd were coming up with Operation Warp Speed. You know, we paid pharmaceutical companies tens of billions of dollars on bets. They were bets. We said to Pfizer, uh, we will buy out your inventory before you have an inventory. All right, they were far along, the research was good, but we gave them over $2 billion to one company, that's a lot of dough. $2 billion, a little bit more, and we said, if you fail, we will cover you. And we did that to lesser degrees to a handful of com companies, there were six or eight of them. So that was going on. Now, as I say, 
uh, life in Washington, D.C., you know, there's lots of politics, lots of criticism, and all the rest of that stuff. But that's what we did. Now, it was not perfect. It was not perfect. But you know what? We got out of that pretty good. You were mentioning that before. And actually, what was supposed to be a 10-year depression turned out to be a two-month pandemic correction. Yeah. Two months. March and April. That was it. The stock market started coming back in late March. The data started coming in by late April, early May. I would go out there every day uh, and do these TV things um, and talk about something called a V-shaped recovery, including the stock market. And the, the, I was talking to mostly business shows, although I had to go on the Sunday shows. But the press, the media, the political media, had moved out of the press room uh, and we're on the driveway, by the, they call it the sticks. You go out, oh, here comes Kudlow, yum, yum, yum. And they were just brutal. They were just, but I, you know, the, the, the best thing was I knew more than they knew. It's to, to your point about economics, they yeah. should know some econ investment managers should know some economics. The really dirty little secret of Washington is the political reporters don't know anything about economics. <laughs> Which gives me a little advantage. Yeah. You know, and they don't know anything about numbers. So I had this thing, Kevin Hassett and I and a few others, uh, I taught everybody uh, in our group, Kevin, I brought in Joel Bourne. I said, when they come at you, start spewing numbers, like <laughs> industrial production and retail sales and existing home sales, and that would just close them down. You know, <laughs> it was like a three no Trump bid and bridge. That was it. And they didn't have anything to say about it. So these reporters would probably like coming to my events where we don't put numbers up on the table, <laughs> but we put pictures for them. <laughs> Tell them, guide uh, them, see? And, and, and POTUS, POTUS just look. I mean, I'm out there selling a V-shaped recovery. It was, I'm a pretty good marketing guy. I'm a pretty good communications guy. Pretty much took everything I had, and I was doing two and three shows a day, plus the Sunday shows. That's what the president wanted. Um, and it reached a point where Mnuchin and I decided, <laughs> better me than him. Yeah. <laughs> Don't repeat that, please. <laughs> but that's, because I stayed on message. I stayed on message. Right. I had a product to sell, and the product was economic recovery uh, because things were reopening. You know, and it was a tough haul. I was up and down, and we'll always be up and down. But look, let's face it, you're at virtually an all-time high in these stock market indexes. So it's like the question, I'd love to ask you this question. Things are so awful, why is the market doing so well? And you do good, you have good, good patterns, good. Uh, <laughs> profits, free money from the Fed, lots of free money. And you know, look, uh, I'll say my take on the economy, this is still, and I don't mean to, be incendiary here. I know there's pluses and minuses about my former boss, but I'm just saying this is still the Trump tax cut economy because they haven't been repealed yet. <laughs> haven't been repealed yet. Now, that's why I got so excited when, uh, you know, this gal, Kirsten Sinema, who, might, as I say, I don't know her, when she said no higher tax rates on corporations and individuals and capital gains. The key there was corporations. You can't run a strong economy unless your businesses, large and small, are healthy. You're not going to create wages or new jobs or certainly productivity or family income. Uh, so, you know, I don't know, they're cooking up this a lot of nonsense that's still out there, unrealized capital gains from billionaires. They won't see a nickel of revenues from that. I, I was worried I wasn't going to get to ask Larry about this piece that he's bringing up because you guys don't know, but he just flew in a few hours ago. He was on the plane on the tarmac at JFK yesterday, <laughs> ready to go, and they have mechanical stuff, and he's on the plane, and then they finally get it fixed, but it's time for the pilots to go, and they make everyone, and they cancel the flight, and he has to go back to the city and then come back and fly out this morning. And I'm thinking, all this stuff about this billionaire uh, tax on, on unrealized capital gains for billionaires, I'm thinking, 
boy, I wonder if, like, while Larry's dealing with American Airlines, if he knows about all this stuff going on, and of course he knows. No, you know, I'm, on, I'm on the phone with my folks, but... Uh, what, do you think, what do you think about this idea? This um, is the stupidest goddamn thing I've ever heard. <laughs> it just is. That was what you call a softball. <laughs> <laughs> it just is. All right? It's just pure, malicious, vengeful attacks from a bunch of far left crazy socialists. And I don't know if it'll go through. They have, they're not even gonna be, figure out a way to administer this. It's so hard. I mean, you, valuation, stock market valuations are easy, but the rest of your wealth is not necessarily liquid. So, and this was floated a few months ago and was laughed out of town. A lot of the European countries tried wealth taxes and even they ended them. Even France yep. ended its wealth tax. <laughs> no, I mean, true. think of that. F 15, 15 countries tried, 15 got rid of it. That's Bernie exactly. Sanders worships Sweden. Okay, I love this. The only trouble well, is... Until, until COVID. He worships a Sweden that doesn't exist. Yeah. Because Sweden has been cutting taxes and deregulating for 20 years. Yeah. And has a very good economy. And he's like singing Das Kapital, and they've nominated this woman to be the controller of the currency, the head of the banking system, who got her degree from Moscow State University on a Lenin fellowship. It's like, you can't make this stuff up. You just can't. Well, you know, you know um, last year during COVID, I gave the commencement address at a little college in Moscow, Idaho. And <laughs> this is a true story. It was a true story. And I heard that she had written her paper and went to college at Moscow. And I go, oh, I spoke up there last year. That's not a big deal. It turns out that's not the Moscow they're talking about. Um, uh, you just can't, uh, you know, here's, you, you see something like that. So she, you know, they're trying to get Pat Toomey, Senator Toomey, wants to get her thesis to yeah. see what she wrote. And then it turns out in the paper yesterday or the day before, she was part of some Marxist group on Facebook. Look, uh, I don't know the woman. Uh, I, I'm not personally, this is not a personal point, but you cannot have the regulator of the United States banking system with a degree from Moscow State University and is a self-proclaimed Marxist who hates bankers. She said she wants to end the banking system and have the US government run all of it, including deposits and loans. That is not worthy of the Democratic Party. That's the point I want to make. They should nowhere near do such a thing. It's just going to kill them. It's like defunding the police, OK? Bad mistake. It's like telling parents they can't go to school board meetings. Yep. Very bad mistake. E even you apart from some of the, the policy side, you're, you you're saying can't the, do the politics are bad. Yes. Well, so what, what, what happens on this bill? You, you um, and I tonight have talked more on the tax side of it. There's, there's the spending side. We did, we did have someone send in a question, and I kind of know your answer, but I want, I want the audience to hear that. Um, do, do you believe the national debt is quite manageable and not a huge problem right now. Um, what are your insights on how America will cope with the debt long term? And the reason I'm setting up the question this way is I think that we share the same opinions on um, incentives and on the supply side tax cuts and, the, and what happens to investment when you tax more of it. And we're against taxing income and we're against taxing business and we're against taxing investment. But the spending side bothers me too. Mm. And the reason is that I believe that the bigger the size of the spending, the less the size of the private sector, which is the human action I referred to earlier of all of these lovely people in the room. I want them acting and they can act more and do more productively at a smaller size of government representation of GDP in our economy. Are you worried about the long-term debt, given that setup? Well, it, it, it kind of it all depends, you know. It all depends. Because here's, at some level, the battle in Washington is to make emergency relief measures where there was a bipartisan consensus, to make them permanent. They were not designed to be permanent. They were designed to substitute government income 
for the loss of personal income temporarily. Now, the Democrats want to make it permanent and add to it. And that does concern me probably, I'll get to the debt in a second, but more than the debt, what concerns me is the degrading of work. In other words, this is classic uh, government welfare dependency. And this is saying work is not important. Leisure is more important and the government of finance. You know, work is a virtue. There is a dignity to work. Amen. In my view, work is a godly virtue. Work is what holds families together. Work is what holds societies together. Somebody who was on welfare dependency for decades and decades and decades has no ladder of opportunity to climb. There's no place to go except getting checks from Uncle Sam. Years ago, um, what's his name? Brooks from the American Enterprise. Arthur Brooks. Arthur Brooks did sociological studies, lengthy, thousands of people. And those, the happiest people were the people who were earning a living, and the unhappiest people were the people on welfare. I mean, he showed that. Uh, with that, you know, using facts and figures. That's what bothers me the most. That's really what bothers me the most, degrading work. And this is a very far left thing and has to be stopped. Now look, the debt today, it depends on the policies. All right, let's say in round numbers, just very round ballpark numbers, we have about 30 trillion in debt. Actually, debt in public hands is about 24 trillion, but it's just called total debt, 30 trillion. Now, household net worth is about 140 trillion. You know, that number is published every quarter by the Federal Reserve. It's the combination of your, all your assets, your stocks, your bonds, your bank accounts, your insurance policies, your home, your cryptocurrency position. <laughs> Just thought I'd put that in there. It's everything you have. Now that number is booming. I mean booming. And it's around 140 trillion. So 30 trillion of government debt, it's really in public hands, about 24 trillion, versus 140 trillion of private household debt is a very good debt to equity ratio. It's really quite low. And I, I wouldn't go bonkers over it. Now, if you tell me in the next 30, 40 years, you know, we're gonna launch a new welfare state, and new entitlements, and there's no workfare, and it's gonna go on and on and on, then what will happen is, the debt will go up, uh, as you said uh, earlier, if for the wrong reasons, and the um, net wealth of the country will, will go down. So I want to see what happens. But right now, I, you know, I, I, it's just a part of me that always liked debt. Debt is as American as cherry pie. I, I get, <laughs> people get too obsessed about debt. But, but Larry, do you think that- Also, I worked for a guy this last time around who knows a lot about debt. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to. I, I, it's funny. It's funny because because <laughs> Larry, Larry and I talk about this issue a lot and kind of have certain areas of overlap and maybe some some parts of disagreement. But um, for you know, back to that issue of partisanship and fairness. You know, uh, I people say to me all the time, like, how can you criticize this administration on debt and the spending? You know, don't you see what's happened under Republican presidents? I go, yeah, that's a good point. Except for I promise you I've been far more critical of Republican presidents than I have yeah. Democrat presidents because it is true. I don't think it's about the president. I think it's about the nature of the relationship of the citizen and the state. It's very hard to put these genies back in the bottle and, and the spending programs become permanent, as you say, quite easily. But I guess my question is back to that issue of work and economic growth. Um, does the debt temper the economic growth? And, and it would seem statistically that it has that as the debt to GDP ratio has grown, we've seen um, economic GDP growth. I don't think now. you can prove that empirically. Well, you definitely can't prove it. It's not falsifiable. I don't think you can prove it. I've seen the work done uh, by, the, what's his name, from Harvard, and post-financial, he's, he's, yeah. he's made a living out of this. Uh, yeah. But this doesn't hold up. I mean, again, 
It's not, the debt is an accounting entry. It's what's behind the debt. You see, if government spending, and by the way, government spending brings with it phenomenal regulatory strings. See, these programs, whether it's healthcare or energy or education, they're funding these programs with very strict regulations, which you don't like. No. You do not like that. There's no school choice, right? This, no. That's not in their model. No. So that's bad. I mean, Laffer would say, uh, I did a pretty good riff on this, one of the specials we had, um, you're paying people not to work, but you're also punishing the people that do work, yeah. okay? So if you just put that together in a common sense, uh, sort of like a, sort of like a, a thought problem, uh, just think about that. You're, so that will create more debt because there'll be less growth. But the debt is a function of the less growth, which is a function of the very bad spending and regulating and taxing policies. Yeah. Look, we increased the debt in the Reagan years. Uh, the guy slashed taxes. He also slashed inflation, which was a big revenue raiser. It was like a second tax cut. And he spent a couple of trillion dollars in 1981 dollars on building up defense. And we ran uh, deficits of 6% of GDP, which today look tame, and those days were not good. But it was temporary. The tax cuts paid for themselves and we beat the Soviet Union. Yeah. You know, we beat their ass into the ground. So <laughs> I, you know, what, I'm just saying, what was, we borrowed for good reasons. We borrowed to invest in the American economy, and we borrowed to invest in American defense, which then, uh, you know, beat the worst totalitarian So similar to a household, history. what the debt is used for, similar to a business, what similar the debt to a is business. used for. Yeah, similar to what a business. What the debt is used for is the key concern you If you have. borrow to buy a good uh, piece of machinery or yeah. equipment, Right, and the rate of return on that over time exceeds the interest rate you paid, it's a good deal. But if you borrow to have a big party where the Red Hot Chili Peppers play, right. then maybe it's it does, If you borrow to you know, finance uh, big dinners at large country clubs. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you oh, there's no borrowed money here, my friend. You have to think about that. Yeah, there's no borrowed money here. <laughs> um, okay, so you brought up the I word, inflation. It's probably become the biggest topic. You talk about on the show a lot. It's a huge topic right now in the news cycle, in the political world, and certainly something on the um, top of minds for a lot of our clients, understandably, in the present environment. You know how I feel, Larry. Uh, prices right now are rising. They're rising, in my mind, around disastrous supply chain and labor shortage issues. But that I do believe secular monetary inflation has been absent for 15 years, just like in Japan, um, around a very, very, very collapsing velocity, a very collapsing loan demand. And you brought up on the clip we played earlier, you've talked about it for years, the dollar's doing very well. If we yeah. had said earlier this year, the dollar would be up 4% on the year on a trade-weighted basis, and yet inflation consumer price index would rise this way. I don't think most of us would have known what to do with that. Well, what do you make of all this? You know, monetary policy has uh, long and variable lags. I mean, the dollar and gold have been well behaved this year. Uh, yeah. But gold soared last year and the dollar fell a lot last year. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, I agree. Look, the, what I call the pandemic inflation, which is these supply shortages and so forth, also, I might add, the uh, role of unions in handcuffing Long Beach and Los Angeles is very bad. I mean, there's, there's stuff coming out now, what they refuse to do. Uh, you know, they'd close down at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. They wouldn't go 24-7. That's a local government issue. It's also a federal government issue, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, that temporary inflation is going to take longer to heal. I think we know that now. So it's, it may take another six months for that stuff. It'll work itself out eventually. I am, however, increasingly worried about the monetary side. Uh, I don't know why the Fed is still buying all these bonds. I don't know why they're injecting all this money. You know, 
even parochial uh, M2 money supply, which properly soared last year and was coming down in growth this year, has now suddenly uh, started poking its head up again. And if we're going to run 12 or 13 percent growth, and the inflation rate year on year is four or five percent, it's not good. The break evens, the break evens now are the five year uh, tips break even is now almost three yeah. percent. It's gone up uh, not a lot. It's I mean, two, 287 today. So that that, that worries me. Um, and ditto for the 10 year break even. And of course, commodity markets have been very, very strong. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm just, I think the Fed has gone too far. Here's what, what I don't want the government is, first of all, I want the spending to be slashed. Okay, that's point number one. But if you reach a situation where the government is spending and spending, uh, you know, at double digit rates long after the emergency is over, and the Federal Reserve is financing that. That is not good. The Fed has bought almost 60% of the new bonds issued in this 18 month period, 57%, uh, Joe Livornia told me. Um, that's not good. That's Latin style central banking. Uh, Powell's running for his life, okay. I know Jay Powell, we had uh, lunch every week for almost three years. He's a nice guy. Um, my only reason for backing him is whoever they put in is going to be worse. Well, that's the thing. That's the but, only No, but thing. I, think, I think that's important because... And some of these names, I mean, I guess the bidding starts at Moscow State University. Yeah, that's I mean, right. Who knows who they're going to put in. Um, first of all, let's just start with, will he reappoint Jay Powell? I think the answer to that is still yes. I don't think these financial transactions have helped them. No. Uh, but there's a difference there. You know, inside, look, the two Reserve Bank presidents should have been fired. They were trading. They were trading. Okay, that is bad. All right, now, Rich Clarida was not trading. He, he rebalanced once a year. Rich is a very dear friend of mine. I helped get him his job as vice chairman, his wife and my wife. Actually, his wife is a former bond trader, mortgage bond. Uh, Jay Powell, uh, I think, was also rebalancing, but I'm not, I'm not sure I understand all those details. And you've got Elizabeth Warren, who wants him fired. She called him the most dangerous man in the earth. You know, if, if the head of the Federal Reserve is the most dangerous man in the earth, you've got to improve your imagination. I mean, really, <laughs> for her to say that just was, uh, what's the word, a real nothingheimer. Yeah. is what that was. So I don't know. I think he will, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I just don't want the Fed to fund all this spending, but mostly I don't want to have all this spending. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I'll go back to my point. This is still the Trump tax cut economy. All right? It still is. Until proven, you know, until the legislation washes that out. And when this uh, gal, Cinema says no corporate tax hike, no individual, no capital gain. I'm saying, wow, wow, that's a whole different ballgame and very encouraging. And I don't think it's a coincidence the stock market picked up its head in the last couple of weeks on that. I, I besides tend to agree. profits. Profits are the mother's milk of stocks, but besides that. Yeah, I think, I guess I should have um, pointed out when I spoke earlier about the importance of profits in driving stocks. That line of profits being the mother's milk of stock market that I did steal that from you many years ago, and, and giving right. you. I said it many years ago. Yes. It's okay. Appropriate attribution is. Um, uh, Yardeni just wrote a whole book on it. Very good book. Well, and I guess I guess at the end of the day, that you know we we do spend a lot of time um, talking about the policy side, and we talk about the monetary side, and and there and all those things matter a great deal. Um, I believe that there can be good presidents, bad presidents, there can be left, right, there can be you know, different policies. I do believe businesses react to those things. I think mm -hmm. they adjust. Mm -hmm. um, the stock market was up eight out of eight years during President Obama. Um, and, and again, people want to go and try to give credit and footnote it and this and that. And I said earlier, people, it presidents get too much credit. They it, get was too much claim. it was up. It was up. I mean, it was up. You know, it got crashed, smashed. And yeah, it, it was pretty up. good timing to enter, you know. <laughs> right. 
Well, that's an interesting. Now, I want, I'm a believer, and you know this, I think. I'm a buy and hold stocks for the long run kind of guy. I, this is Jeremy Siegel's thesis from 10. Um, You're going to hold your stocks till the next 40 years when you go back to the White House? Well, I can't buy bonds. No. I mean, nobody can buy bonds now. You just can't because you're, you're only getting, you know, the average yield is a buck sixty. I don't think it has a lot of downside in yield, upside in price. I would say the risk reward ratio the other a way. Skewed risk reward there, huh? Uh, stock market, yeah, it's hitting record highs, but as long as profits are rising. But I, you know, I can't. I've never. I'm not smart enough to pick the turn. Uh, you know, catch everything. I just can't do it. I, I don't believe it can be done. So your, your long stocks, your, your not so long bonds, are you long America, Larry? I love America. I love America. I, I, I set up your, your, the happy warrior reputation. Yes. Um, I know you believe in a classically liberal free society. I love your demeanor. I love your optimism. You heard people tonight as we were walking around saying the same thing, it's what um, attracts you to so many people. But I think all of us could benefit from some of your optimism now. What, do you believe our best days are in front of us? I do, I'm a great follower of uh, one Thomas Jefferson, who I've also never met. Um, <laughs> but we are endowed by our creator. We are endowed by our creator with the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is the single greatest sentence in the English language. And as long as we stay with it, we'll be fine. I um, want to thank Larry for sticking it out with these flight travel issues for coming out west. Uh, he does have a show every single day. Um, and he ended up having to miss his show today. We were hoping that wouldn't happen. Um, he's, he's flying back to New York tomorrow. Um, so him giving up a couple days of his show to be with us is something I appreciate a great deal. I appreciate um, him being here to share with you his view on things and him constantly being a source of information, of perspective, and a friendship to all of us at the Bonson Group. Please give, me, uh, give Larry another hand for joining me. Um, I, I also, because I kind of got started so quickly, it, go ahead and see it. I think you guys have your dessert, right? Okay. Um, if the, you saw me once or twice grab the phone when Larry and I were talking, I want to assure you I was not writing back to a client email when Larry was talking. I had to, I had to text the team to make sure that, are they eating dinner or dessert? Because I didn't know if we needed to go for five more minutes or for two more hours. Um, very hard to time it. But speaking of the, the team tonight, um, I cannot tell you how much work my wife, Jolene, put into this event tonight. Um, there, are, there are so many details that go into this type of event. It's large, it's complex. Uh, contrary to Larry's concern, it is paid for with cash, not debt. <laughs> but it also uh, takes place um, because of the work of um, a lot of people. I'm thankful for the entire team, but this particular event Jolene really poured herself into, and I'm just very thankful for her. She's on a roll right now. She was out in Minnesota handling all the furniture install and decor and design of our new office in Minnesota. Um, she just a couple months earlier, along with our uh, office manager from New York City who's here tonight. Abigail, where are you? I think you should say hi to everybody. Abigail's in the back there. <laughs> T 
So a Abigail's our Erica of the New York office. Uh, all of you know our office manager here, Erica. But, but Jolene's just been on our role doing all the work. And so it, is, it isn't just because she's my wife. If, if it was a person at TBG who I wasn't married to who was doing all this, I'd call them out the same. But along with Jolene's deserved recognition, the work that our respective office managers, Erica and Abigail, you know, but here tonight, you really do have, I mean, we had a long meeting today with all of our advisors, and, and as I was sitting there talking, we were sharing ideas and, and speaking, I am just so proud of the advisors that we work with at the Bonson Group. Um, different skills, different experiences, and yet this sort of collective knowledge and collective care for our clients that I cannot tell you how valuable it is. It means a lot to me as the managing partner of the business, but I really hope it means a lot to you. Um, I'm just absolutely, I have a very low opinion. I've been saying this for years, anyone in the room, and there's some of you who have been clients for over 20 years. I've had a very negative opinion of the financial advisory profession since I entered it, for very good reason. I know more than you will ever know. But at the Bonson Group, I just can't tell you how proud I am of the partners and advisors we have. And so I hope that you uh, are blessed tonight to, to be with the advisor that you are here with tonight. Um, thank you, yeah. Um, I believe that we have covered all we needed to cover. And most important, you guys have had dessert. Um, Larry slept like two hours in the last two days. I've slept two hours in the last two months. S Jolene hasn't slept in, you know, since uh, our firstborn came. Um, so we will bid you adieu. We will get back together again after the new year. Um, in the meantime, it's hard to believe, but like we're a month away from Thanksgiving. We're two months away from Christmas. Um, you know, we're going to be doing a lot of work to kind of make sure we feel that we're positioned the right way going into the new year. Um, I'm with Larry. I do believe that the equity positions are intended to be very long term, but we always want to be sensitive and conscious to valuation and, and we have to look at those things. Um, it, it, earnings season is for the sixth time in a row appearing to be one that's going to outperform expectations. The engine of free enterprise is powerful. People have bet against it generally get it wrong. But in the meantime, there's other concerns and issues out there. We gotta monitor those things too. I write about it every single day. The writing is a lot of work, but it is one of the great blessings in my professional life because I never have the option of saying, I'm gonna wake up today. You know, I get up before four in the morning every day and I never once can get up and say, I'm not gonna read today. I'm not gonna study today. I can't do it because I have to commit myself to that writing and that sort of you know, um, consumption of knowledge that is necessary to share perspective and so forth that I hope is valuable. The, the honest truth is that we're gonna enter 2022 in, for me, a more stressful position than we entered 21. And that's ironic, because entering 21, they had announced the vaccine at the end of 20, but it, had, it hadn't started yet as far as its distribution. The sort of miracle of Operation Warp Speed was just about to kick off. Uh, we hadn't inaugurated a new president yet. We didn't know what was going to happen in Georgia. There was all this uncertainty entering 21, and yet I didn't feel the anxiety I, did, I do now then because I have this really aspirational hope that there will be strong business investment going into next year. And I don't know that there will be. I have, there has to be more time to read that data. We, got, we have to get the supply chains working again. We need a little more clarity on policy. Those things matter. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, whether it's first quarter of 2022 or third quarter of 23, there's going to be hiccups. There's going to be you know, disruptions in the way risk assets perform. It just doesn't seem like it right now. Um, and that apathy or complacency that kicks in is generally when, when I get more concerned. So that's what is keeping us up at night. Um, and also, you know, USC. It's one, I will tell you this though, I've been watching UCLA lose games for like 20 years and they always lose in the past by so much. And now they're losing these really close games and we're losing by a lot. And I kind of prefer the way we're losing because it's not like heartbreaking. You're just like, we're not a very good team and you lose. But they've lost some heartbreakers. But they actually have a really good team this year. But um, no, yeah, the, the USC stuff, you know, uh, very similar to the market. It doesn't matter because we fight on. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>